So you've been working away on desensitization because you know, you've been told that that's the way to get your dog over separation anxiety. But somehow it's just not working. You feel like your dog is just never going to get there. So at what point do you say, heck, this is just not working for me and my dog? At what point do you say that and just decide it's time to stop trying desensitization and give something else a go? Well, in this week's podcast episode, I want to talk to you all about this big decision. Whether and how you know it's time to stop gradual exposure, to stop desensitization and to give something else a go. Hello and welcome to the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. Hi, I'm Julie Naismith, dog trainer, author, and full-on separation anxiety geek. I've helped thousands of dogs overcome separation anxiety with my books, my online programs, my trainer certification, and my separation anxiety training app. And this podcast is all about sharing my tips and tricks to help you teach your dog how to be happy at home alone too. So desensitization is the tried and trusted method for separation anxiety. It's not just that I say that because that's what I teach and that's what I advise everyone who works with me to do. I mean, I teach pet parents how to do it with their dogs. I teach trainers how to help pet parents with their dogs using desensitization. So yeah, I am pretty wedded to it. But I didn't just wake up one day and think, ooh, that sounds interesting. Maybe we should give that a go. It's not like this is some wonky, weird notion from out there. The reason I say desensitization is tried and trusted is because when you look at the research, and there's lots of research about separation anxiety, by the way, when you look at the research, it's really conclusive that this is, as far as we can tell, the best chance that a dog has of overcoming his fear of being left. And it's not just in the dog world that desensitization works. When we look at how humans overcome fears, desensitization is at the very heart of the preferred method for most therapists. Now, do I need to just stop and say, what is this desensitization thing? I will. I think you might already know, but let me not assume. So desensitization is a process of essentially exposing our dogs to the thing that they're scared of. I know that sounds weird, right? We're trying to help them not feel scared. And so what we do is we expose them to something that they're scared of. It's a form of therapy called exposure therapy. And exposure therapy is that. It's about taking a stimulus that a human or a dog has an issue with, has a phobia to, a fear of, and exposing the subject to the feared stimulus. And there are a range of ways of doing it. At one end, there's the sink or swim approach, which is called flooding, where essentially we just expose the subject to the scared thing, the scary stimulus at full intensity, like to the max. And flooding is sometimes used in human therapy and it sometimes does result in good outcomes. But it's really problematic. It's problematic because it doesn't always result in a good outcome. It can make people worse. It can make a subject worse. And it's a really horrible process to go through. So when human therapists decide to use flooding, they do it with consent. They do it with informed consent. They tell their patient that it could be awful. It will be awful because it's a full-blown exposure to the thing that petrifies them. They explain the risks and they explain the upsides. And when it works, well, that's a great outcome. That's fabulous. And, you know, the patient may well forget how horrific it was. But when it works, it works in tandem with a therapist being there to explore how the patient feels after their full-blown exposure. 
right? So if we think about whether we could use that with a dog, well, that gets really difficult, doesn't it? Because we can't ask for informed consent. We could ask the human, the pet parent for informed consent, but that's not the same as asking the dog whether they want to go through this horrible process. And then also the bit that's missing is this rational discussion at the end, this, well, you went through that, but you survived, didn't you? Woohoo! So you can't do that with a dog. You can't have that conversation. And so instead of opting for flooding, which is inhumane and unethical when it comes to dogs, we go to the other end of the exposure therapy continuum, and that's gradual exposure. And gradual exposure and desensitization, you can kind of think of them as being the same things. In the dog training world, we tend to say desensitization. In the human therapy world, we tend to say gradual exposure. But the concept is the same. It's taking a small amount of the thing that the patient or the subject, the dog in our case, is worried about, and you gradually increase the intensity. The intensity starts so low that there's no fear. And you increase the intensity as long as there is no fear. And it works. It does work. It works for dogs and it works for humans. But there are some downsides. And if you are working with a dog with separation anxiety, you might already be well aware of the downsides. But it takes time. The biggest complaint that most people have is just how long it takes, especially with a dog. Why are dog and human brains different? Well, they're actually pretty similar, but it's much harder. Well, it's impossible to have the type of relationship. If you're a behavior consultant or a trainer, you don't have the type of relationship with a dog that a therapist has with a patient. We are gradually exposing the dog to alone time, to the scared stimulus, but we're not having an engaging conversation about how does that feel and how did you respond and do you think you could have responded differently? All we've got, the only tool that we've got is the exposure. Now, lots of studies say that it's actually all about the exposure. The exposure to the scared stimulus matters. But we definitely can't engage the dog in conversations about how the process is going. Could we do it differently? Can we improve it? And so on. So, it can be a lengthy process. Getting a dog over something that it really fears isn't days, it's not even weeks. For most dogs, we're talking months, months and months. And that's hard. If you've got a dog that you can't leave and your life is suspended, you have no freedom, you have to think about every single thing you do because you can't leave your dog. You're always thinking, how do I get cover for my dog? What can I do? I can't leave the dog. I'm going to have to say no to that. That's life, right? With a dog with separation anxiety. And so dealing with that while at the same time doing this training, which is energy sapping, even just doing the training takes time and it takes energy and you have to do it for a long time. So no wonder lots of people start to feel like, oh, I just can't do this. This just isn't for me. And that like I say, is typically the biggest complaint I hear from people that it is just taking too long. The reason it takes too long, well, too long, yeah, it's too long. But the reason why it takes so long, why are we talking months? Why are we talking such an extended period of time? Is because we're trying to create a brand new association in your dog's brain. And we're fighting against the old association. So we're trying to create new neural pathways in your dog's brain. And that's not an instant thing. Not only are we trying to create these new neural pathways, but dogs have, just like us, fairly lazy brains. And so it's easier for a dog and it's easier for us to always revert to old negative thinking. It's just easier. The old negative neural pathways are nicely grooved and it's easier to revert to them. And so as we're doing this gradual exposure training, it's really common for dogs, actually, and for us, to revert to how we used to think, to revert to those old associations. So it takes time, it's up and down, and so it becomes an emotional roller coaster journey that's drawn out too. No wonder we all 
end up at some point feeling exhausted. And by the way, there isn't anybody who's now got a dog over separation anxiety, whose dog has recovered as a result of using desensitization. There's not a single person who hasn't felt like giving up, who hasn't felt exhausted, who hasn't felt like this is never going to work for them. But they continue. How about you though? Maybe you're thinking, no, I just can't. I just cannot do this anymore. I can't cope with the ups and downs. I can't cope with how long it's taking. I actually really don't like the training either. And that bit I really understand because it's not like trick training, is it? It's not like having fun with your dog at agility or doing scent work. It's labor and it is pretty dull. Let's be honest. I mean, actually a big part of separation anxiety training is being dull. It's about making you leaving dull. So it's not something most of us get up in the morning and say, I can't wait to do, I can't wait to do separation anxiety training today. No wonder then you have moments where you think, I, I know this is the right thing to do, but I am done. So how do you know? How do you know if it's not just a bad period that you're going through, but it's time for you to give up? Well, before you do, I need you to ask some questions of yourself. Question number one, when you're training, could you be missing something? Anything. Is it possible that you are missing some signs of anxiety in your dog? Is it possible that you're missing some subtle micro tells where your dog is actually trying to communicate that they aren't having a good time? Because remember, when we're doing desensitization training, we're changing the association from I hate hate this, this is scary to, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can do this. So if the dog is anxious when we're training, we're not changing that response. That means if we miss things, we could be doing the training very diligently, checking them off. If you're in my separation anxiety heroes group, you'll be ticking off your exercises in the app. You'll be looking at how many times you're trained and thinking, well, you know, at some point I'm going to make some progress, aren't I? But if you're not, maybe it's because your training and your dog is actually anxious. So you don't get the progress you need because you're just missing some things. So when was the last time you really, really, really studied a video of your dog? Are you recording your sessions? Are you looking at them, slowing them down, looking for signs that your dog might be anxious. Because if you're not, I don't want you to give up on desensitization training before you do that. Okay, so ask yourself, am I missing something? And if you think you might be, study video of your dog. Make sure you record your sessions. Question number two to ask yourself before you give up. Could you be misinterpreting something? So maybe you are spotting things, but maybe that two lip licks that your dog does would be fine in one dog, but actually in your dog means your dog is anxious. When did you last have some help deciding that? Now, in an ideal world, I'd love it if all of you could work with trainers, but I know that's not possible for many of you. It would be amazing if you could all work with one of my certified separation anxiety pro trainers and have them look at your dog's body language. You record the video and get them to look at it. But I know that's not possible for many, many of you. An alternative, of course, is to join my separation anxiety heroes club. And that's a much more affordable option for many people. But not for everybody. So if you're thinking, okay, Julie, that's great. Yeah, I think I might be misinterpreting something, but how am I going to get that help? Well, jump into my free separation anxiety support group. There are plenty of pet parents in there who either have been through what you're going through and have got their dogs over separation anxiety, or they're going through it right now. They're going through the training. Have a look at videos they post for peer review. See if they are saying things about their dog that you could recognize in your dog. But just really importantly, think about, am I misinterpreting something and am I missing stuff? 
Okay, question number three. Before you give up, I do want you to ask all these questions. So question number three. Are you being too impatient? You're like, oh, Julie, stop it. Stop, stop, stop. Of course I'm impatient because I want to get my life back. I know. I know and I remember that feeling so badly when Percy was a dog who, even if I thought about leaving, would start getting upset. I just thought we are never, ever, ever, ever going to have any even a semblance of normal life again. But we got there. However, I felt impatient too because I, I didn't, I wanted it now and I wanted to see progress and I wanted to feel like there was light at the end of the tunnel. And so when we feel like that, often what we do is we put pressure on ourselves because we focus on, you know, the two hours and the three hours. And that's really important. Of course it is because your whole aim of doing this separation anxiety training is you want to get your dog to be okay for a reasonable amount of time that allows you to do something. But human nature is such that when we focus on a big, lofty, ambitious goal like that, we often feel overwhelmed. Not only do we feel overwhelmed, but we feel way away from it. We feel like we're not making progress because think about it. If you're climbing a mountain, you're at the bottom of the mountain and maybe you're looking up and you're climbing a 10,000 foot mountain and you're maybe five foot or six foot. So you compared to 10,000 feet, that's a huge gulf. You are insignificant compared to that 10,000 feet mountain. And that's really where you are with separation anxiety training. What you do today, the 30 seconds, the one minute and 10 seconds, yeah, that's teeny compared to the two or three hours. And you can feel like that is just nothing. It's nothing because three hours is what matters and you're on a minute. But just as when you stand at the bottom of the mountain, as tiny as you are, to get to the top, you take tiny steps. And that's what you need to do. You focus on the step in front of you and then the step in front of that and just put one foot in front of another. I mean, literally one foot in front of another with separation anxiety training, right? Because you're doing the steps, you're going out of the door and you're coming back. The whole purpose of thinking that way is that you focus on the process. You focus on what can I do to do this really well? Not, oh, how do I get to three hours? But what can I do to make sure that in this training session today, my dog has a really good experience of being left? Because every single time your dog has a positive experience of being left, you've just taken one step closer to the top of the mountain. So focus on that exercise. Focus on today. If you've just done today's exercise, focus on tomorrow. Don't think any further ahead than that. And just try and get every session to mean your dog has had an association that home alone is fine. Home alone is fine. It's all those teeny, 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 tiny steps that will add up to get you to the three hours. Also, don't do the maths on it. So if you're at 10 minutes and it's taking you weeks or months to get to 10 minutes, I don't want you to do the maths on it. So don't get your calculator out and say, okay, if I'm at 10 minutes after two months, then do, 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 and you put the numbers in your calculator and you go, oh my goodness, I'm going to be 80 before my dog gets to two hours. Don't do the maths because it's not like that. The first few minutes, the lower minutes take a long time. You spend way more time on those because The beginning of the change is the biggest challenge for your dog. So the beginning, the crew.